Good morning, I'm Valerie Milano, the senior editor of the Hollywood Times, and I'm so happy to have this uh, this show on today. Everyone else burns, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, please. Uh, I'm Dylan Mapletoft. I'm the co-writer and co-creator of Everyone Else Burns. I'm Oliver Taylor. I'm also co-writer and co-creator. I'm Molly Seymour, and I am the producer of Everyone Else Burns. Beautiful. Thank you. It's a beautiful day here, and uh, the show's terrific. This is a brilliant, uh, brilliant English satire. I laughed from start to finish. Um, it set, uh, satires religious extremism and uh, the end of the world, as well as taking shots at independent women, women, television, education, young love, so many targets, and it hits them all. Um, the father, David, is such a devotee to his faith, to a fault. Um, and he seems to have, you know, passed in the past. He's trying to overcome the references in episode two about uh, the cell phone, having seen history and not um, being plugged in since 9-11, certainly were dark and, and hint at David's involvement in perhaps some religious e extremism of the other kind. And now he's a true believer who's trying to save his family and himself so that everyone else does indeed burn instead of them. Is this the classic comedy trope, a once ultra bad guy trying to be an ultra good person, dragging his family, kicking and screaming all the way? Uh, it's a funny one. I mean, I think uh, we, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's an interesting interpretation of David, I guess, because I think we, um, we never really imagined him being a, 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 a bad guy, did we, Ollie? No, I he think, just needs um, just a dense dad with an old phone that uh, leaks battery acid. Yeah, it, 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 it was more that sense of that. yeah, that sense of anachronism as being part of his character, and that sense of being someone who you know almost kind of ob obstinately refused to kind of um, get on board with kind of certain trends and took a sort of perverse pride in kind of not not having a mobile phone and and things like that. Yeah, we definitely didn't imagine him as a. Um, any kind of religious extremist i would say one of the things we did want to talk about was people's different lenses on religion we've got characters who take their faith so to heart that they give them a lot of anxiety like rachel like fiona who puts a lot of restrictions on their life david is one of those people who the threat of imminent hellfire the idea that you have to be held to a very high standard he coasts with all of that and he feels very relaxed about it and uh, he has probably an undue a uh, sense of confidence and a sense that everything is going to be all right. He, he could do with being taken down a peg. He probably should be more worried. Yeah, I think we 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 hopefully see. We'd like to think that within the show, we we see some people who are really, uh, you know, kind of grounded and centered and sort of humble in their faith. And David is definitely not that. You know, there's lots about how he's kind of he's almost latching on to all the wrong things he's he's like funneling his own pride into it and he's um obsessing over these tiny kind of little rules without actually maybe seeing the big picture of what the the, the church is all about and the faith is all about so I think that was something that we wanted to explore with him and and also yeah this sense of a guy who feels like he you know he has this kind of prideful like wanting to kind of step into a sort of old-fashioned patriarchal role and yet at the same time um the moment that's questioned like when melissa meets you know fiona and sort of activates her in a little bit of episode uh two is it um he folds he folds immediately you know and she's really sort of wearing the trousers in that union i guess hey thank you um Let's try this one. The family is a collection of typical characters, a mom feeling stifled, a daughter who just wants to be a teenager, and a son who wants to idolize a dad he sees as uh, flawed. The vicar and the deacon, the would-be boyfriend, the lure of independence. Then you add the fanatical father and you have the uh, a comedy, you know, magic. With so many working parts is... Is there a danger of there being too many things going on for audiences to follow? We hope that 
as you've mentioned, we've got some recognizable archetypes in there, hopefully some struggles that will be very relatable to people coming of age, feeling disconnected in the modern era, um, you know, generational divides and so on. What we wanted to do was explore those things that people can get their teeth into and hopefully can feel a relationship with, but in a setting that hopefully they haven't seen in a comedy context before. Um, one with naturally high stakes where, you know, uh, making the wrong decision or uh, not being pious enough could get you excluded as we saw with Joshua in the show. Um, so the hope is that um, uh, whilst it's a unique setting, uh, the experiences that the characters are going through will be something that people will be able to uh, recognize. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, though. I think it's one of the challenges that certainly Ollie and I were mindful of and are mindful of it when we're writing in terms of finding that right balance between being able to sit with the characters and, you know, is there an, is there too much story? Because we're sort of trying to do a bit of a hybrid in terms of sitcoms, I guess, that on the one hand, you know, we we love some of those kind of American returnable sitcom models, but also we wanted the characters to develop and progress a bit. So it's not just sort of a straight reset every week. So it throws up that challenge um, of kind of keeping the characters growing and changing while without sort of overloading it full of too much stuff. And actually, in here in the UK, you know, the response to that sort of combination of the two um, styles has actually, you know, I think surprised people. I think they think that they're getting something. And then by the end of the series, not to give anything away for anyone that hasn't seen it, but you're, you know, you're really invested in this family and all of their wrong and right choices. Um so yeah, I think the more the merrier because Dylan and Ollie are absolute masters at creating an ensemble of people that you love. Thank you. Um, the casting is fantastic, particularly like Simon Bird as David and Cato Flynn as the long suffering wife. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, and likewise, Amy James Kelly as the anxious teen daughter is spot on. Um, talking about the casting process, if you would. Molly, do you want to do you want to take this one? I'd love to take this one. Well, so we we had um, the amazing Aisha Bywaters, um, who is uh, a fantastic after winning um, casting director here in the UK, who also cast We Are Lady Parts, which is another Universal Peacock co pro, um, and Aisha was you know just incredible at sort of finding. Um, sort of newer faces like Amy and Harry who plays Aaron as well as sort of you know hearing our um desire to have the kind of best of British comedy so we have a real sort of um range of comedy faces dramatic faces of who are amazing at comedy and I think that combination means that we just have this yeah incredible ensemble um yeah I mean, there's so much to say about our cast. They're the best. Yeah, I agree. Um, as I was pre preparing for this interview, I read some reviews um, and the critics seem to like the show. How is this translating to American audiences? Are viewers embracing this very British satire and this in uh, in the show developing a solid following? Uh I mean, I guess that in terms of sort of numbers and stuff, I, I I hope so. But I think thankfully Ollie and I don't don't actually know about that stuff. But I mean, I would say the the press has been absolutely amazing. You know, it's 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 been so yeah, it's just been incredible. I think that we've been so 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 pleased to feel like it is resonating over there, and that hopefully there is an audience for it or an appetite for it uh, building is what I'd say really. Yeah, definitely blown away by the critical reception. We really appreciate that. You always wonder about how something is going to travel and it feels like uh, it's being appreciated, which is great. And I think also adding to that, you know, we made this show the way we wanted to make it. And um, it's, it you know, it's a really specific subject matter. But as we just discussed with big universal themes and the fact that we were able to kind of set it in Manchester and have the cast that we want and you know all of those elements and the fact that 
an American audience are still relating and enjoying all of the jokes and the brilliant writing and these performances just yeah it means means so much yeah no, and I think I, I mean I just think we should say it, that's a testament to Molly really you know and, and everyone at Jack's and also you know our partners at NBC and and obviously Channel 4 in the sense that you know they I think together have really helped Ollie and I be sort of more ambitious with it in terms of believing in the story as something that actually could play internationally because it's you know it's it's kind of a dream come true to to be able to write a show that would have a, an audience overseas and I think we had you know before we'd actually got a partner for this we had looked at shows that say Jacks were making and that NBC were making and thinking you know wouldn't it be amazing to be kind of creatively involved with with companies like these ones and amazingly we got it you know we got we got the sort of dream combination excellent good thank you um without spoiling things where is the show headed plot wise will the lewis family slowly succumb to the pressure of society's lures or will david be able to keep them together with the fear of ap apocalypse and eternal hell I definitely I mean, think... didn't speak at all in the last question. So, so it's on me. Yeah, you're right. This entirely. <laughs> I was like, I'll sit that one out and then I'm sure we'll get an easy uh, softball later. So this now on. We'll tell you what the plot is when we know. Um, <laughs> it, I think that Rachel's ongoing struggle uh, between her personal independence and her connection to her faith, her commitment to her family, that's definitely going to be a core part of where the series goes. Continuing um, the marital struggles between David and Fiona, what's keeping them together, what could push them apart will definitely be ongoing. Um, I don't want to give too much away about what happens at the end of season one, uh, but the uh, excluded character Joshua and what role he plays in Rachel's life going forward is definitely going to be a big factor. And uh, Aaron, the kid of the family, might have some uh, industrious battles of his own to fight on a grander scale against the Order at large. So we'll see how that looks. Well, again, thank you for your patience with me and continuing on. And again, a great show. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. You so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.